Welcome to Fierce Female Filmmakers, a production of Artemisia's Daughters, a non-profit organization that aims to inspire, educate, empower, and employ women of all ages and backgrounds in the film and TV industries. Hello. Today, my guest on Fierce Female Filmmakers is Emma Butt. She is a dubbing mixer, an ADR recordist, and a sound designer. And we're going to hear all about those jobs and her life. Emma, welcome. Hello. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited. Well, thank you so much for, for joining us. And I'm just fascinated by the world of sound. It's one of my favorite things to put into my films. It's, it's another language. It's another layer of creativity that, that you can help tell the story without dialogue, without music and, and, and underscores the action and the story. Tell me a little bit about how you came, when did you wake up one day and say, I'm going to be a sound designer? I'm sure it didn't quite happen like that. But but how did you get started? So uh, I grew up in Ireland, um, which is obviously a very ca- Catholic country. And as part of that, it meant that we were always in uh, church choirs. We were always involved in the church in some way. And so I grew up really into music. And I was part of my school choir, my church choir. And at one point, our school choir decided that they wanted to record a CD for charity. So we went along to this um, church, of course, and this guy came along with his mixing desk and his microphones. And I was just like, that is the coolest fucking thing I've ever seen. Um, I want to do that. And I was about 15 at the time. And I knew we were kind of at that point where we had to make a decision about what we were going to do at university or college, as we call it back in Ireland. Um, And I decided that was it. I wanted to go and study sound engineering. So I started researching universities in Dublin that I could study at and uh, found somewhere, applied a year too early. And they were like, calm the feck down, wait until you're a little bit older, then come back to us. And, uh, did you have you a know. conversation with that sound engineer that day? Did you, did he did. engage with you and, and sort of show you a little bit about what he was doing? Because it must have been unusual for him to have a young person come over and, and be interested in what in his job. I think I was too embarrassed to ask too many questions. I think a few of us actually, you know, were stood around and he was kind of explaining to, to us what he was doing and how it all worked. And actually our teacher at the time was incredible Um, And she explained it as well. And she explained how the whole process happened. So I think it was more from her side of things than his. Um, But yeah, it was just, I was hooked because I knew at the time I knew I wanted to do something in music, which obviously hasn't ended up happening. But I knew I wasn't good enough to pursue a career as a singer. Um, I was never like, I was okay at singing, but I was never, you know, fucking Mariah Carey or something. So I was always looking for alternatives that revolved around music, but wasn't being a singer. And this was the perfect fit. So, yeah. So you applied and they were like, too soon. Go yeah. home. <laughs> Calm down. Um, and they were like, wait for a year and then apply again. So I did. And because the education system in the, uh, in Ireland at that time was, very, very different. So third level education was free. Um, So it just was points based on how well you did in your exams as to what course you could get into. But this university was private, so it meant you had to pay for it. And it didn't matter what you got in your exams. So all I had to do was go for an interview and they would kind of suss out if I had the passion to do it because this was such a small university and they actually they were a recording studio as well. So they were a working studio. So it meant you got really good experience. Um, so I went, did my interview and found out that I had a place. So I, I didn't slack off my exams, but I didn't study as hard as I probably should have. Um, and yeah, so I went and I did the course for two years. Absolutely loved it. And it was great because it didn't just focus on music. It did radio and TV and film as well. And that's kind of where post-production sound came in. So we had to take like a small cartoon like Tom and Jerry and it had no sound on it. And we had to recreate everything from scratch. And one of our other projects was we had to create a radio drama. So we had to create all the sound effects for it. We had to do all the voices, the acting, everything. And I was like, this is really cool. Like, I have an interest in this. And then about three months before my course was due to finish, I had the panic that I'm sure every student does, which is, 
oh feck I need to get a job and I need to get one quick so I start applying to every single studio in Dublin whether it was music or whether it was film or tv and I got an interview for this post-production house so I went along it was just for a runner making tea and coffee and doing you know whatever you had to do basically and did the interview I think it was like on a Monday and they said we'll let you know by the Friday Friday came hadn't heard anything so I followed up on it and I just sent them a really nice email and was like you know, just want to check in, just want to see if you've made any decisions, absolutely not a bother, you know, if you've decided to go with someone else. And lo and behold, they had hired someone else, they had hired another girl. And just that day, just after I had emailed, she had gone on her lunch break and never came back. She decided that the job wasn't for her. So I emailed at just the right time because they called me back straight away and said, can you start on Monday? It's one of those wonderful serendipitous moments of just putting yourself forward with with no expectation of the outcome. Yeah, uh, like I couldn't believe it, but I was also a cheeky feck that day because I had pulled a sickie from university and then I had to, I obviously get this phone call and because they wanted me to start immediately and I still had three months left of my course, I had to go into the university and be like, um, so first I wasn't sick, um, so very sorry. And um, secondly, um, look, I've been offered this job and they need me to start and it would be full time. Can I finish my university course part time for the next three months? And actually they were amazing. They were like, uh, yeah, like this is what we're training you for. Yeah, <laughs> of course you can. It's kind of the goal. Yes, yes. I mean, it can be difficult sometimes when you're in a in an academic situation yeah. or, you you know, they think you've made a commitment to to being at school Um I think it's tough for them too because then you know if they don't have if say you never graduated then they've they've lost a, a number it becomes about numbers for them but that was that was great that they understood how important that was and and what a great you know to f- yeah. li- not quite fall into a full time job but that's how you learn you know you can only learn the technicalities for so long and then you just have to get out there and do it but you said you were making tea and stuff to begin with how long did it take them before they let you loose on a on a board well I was kind of I'm quite ambitious and as soon as I was in there I was pestering all of the audio department and so I was asking them if I could sit in I was asking them if they could give me small projects that I could work on in my own time I was asking if I could use the studios out of hours and work on my university projects and the company was really really great like everybody from the MD all the way down through the staff they encouraged that so I think within a week I was starting to you know get my hands on the desk and learn about all of the different processes and sitting in on sessions and so it only really took me five months as a runner which is fairly unheard of usually you're a runner for like a year or more um but I was, it, it was just a really, really, I, I put my hands up and say I was very, very lucky. But after five months, they saw that I was really hard working and I really wanted it. And what they did, which I think was very clever, was they put me on reception and they got me to do the audio bookings. And they were like, we're going to get you to do this for six months, partly because we need to fill the six months while someone's off. But also we want the clients to get to know you. Um, we want them to get used to you. And then after that six months, we're going to put you into audio as an audio assistant um, in commercials and short form content and, you know, see how it goes. And that's what happened. Hated short form. Absolutely hated it. Um, because, can, can you, do you know why? Yeah, it was really sexist. Um, it was so sexist. It, it There was one occasion where I had a client uh, come into the room and he was, he was, so we had a board of directors and we had two main MDs and one of the main MDs was still a picture editor and this was his client. So this MD walked into the studio where I was and he brought in his client and they wanted me to do like the sound mix, a temp sound mix on this 30 second commercial. The client walked in, took one look at me didn't like me instantly because I was a woman and I'd say because of my age as well doubted my experience doubted my skill set automatically and this was for a temp track it wasn't even for this was a final. yeah 
yeah and um so my my md kind of you know introduced us and then left the room to let us get on with it and this client just proceeded to start shouting at me and start being really really disrespectful uh, to the point where I had to go and complain to my MD afterwards and just be like, this is a bit insane. Like, this was really horrible. And my MD was very understanding about it and it was all okay and it was fine and I never had to work with that person again. But that wasn't an isolated incident. I would constantly have it where the commercial clients would walk into the studio and sometimes I was assisting on sessions. So the main mixer would be at the desk and I'd be at the side and I'd maybe have to go over to another computer to source sound effects for him so he could get into a session or, you know, I'd act as an in-session runner or I'd do random things just to help the session go quicker. And the clients wouldn't even look at me in the eye. They wouldn't even acknowledge that I was there. I would just and be these totally... Were always, these were nearly always male clients as well. Yeah. There's very few women. And they're not... They're not okay, let's, let's break it down too. These are radio ads. So they're, they're, they're getting a, a, a radio ad, a 30-second ad to put on, you know, that's, that for their brand, for their company. So they're not even creatives. They're just people wanting to spend some money to make some money. It's a mixture so it was a mixture of creatives and so it was usually the ad agencies and their clients who were like the brands. So it was a combination of both of them and it would be radio and TV commercials. And it was the same across the board, no matter what it was. And then I started, the company was, the company I worked for, especially in Ireland, because the industry is so small, the companies have to be multi faceted so they did long form and they did short form so they did drama feature animation and then tv and radio content and the irish film industry is amazing there's a lot of fantastic films that come out of ireland so you were part you got caught up in that in that stream of of feature and television yeah well eventually because because i was having such a bad experience with short form and i knew that the long form clients were nicer and it was a better experience, I pushed my MDs and I kind of said, I want to go into that. I don't want to be in short form. I don't enjoy this. It's not for me. I want This is what I want to do. And I think I pestered them so much that they just wanted to shut me up. <laughs> so they're just like, okay, we'll give you an opportunity. We'll, we'll see how this goes. And that's kind of what happened. I, I ended up staying in long form. And I remember the conversation with my MD. And at the time I was just like, I don't agree with this. I hate this. And I resented it for a very, very long time. And I actually agree with what he did now. But he said to me, I want to put you, I want to hire you and I want to promote you because you're a woman. And because I know that women, um, other women who are clients will walk into the room, they'll see you and they'll feel more at ease. And you'll be able to have conversations about things that they just can't have with the male mixers in the company. And I kind of remember leaving that meeting being like, you fecking arse like how fecking dare you you should be promoting me because I'm good I'm the token woman to, to you know but, <laughs> but I guess he saw you as a as a valuable asset for, in that respect because of the it, what he was talking about was the communication am, uh, aspect and the and the empathy the potential empathy he saw between between you and the lack of it with with the male clients oh gosh so talk a little bit about, so talk a bit, little bit, let's break down a little bit those three titles that you have that, that separate, that are separate, but connected and, and, you know, wh which of those you do, how you do them, just so that somebody who's listening and goes, okay, well, I understand how I could get, you know, started, but what, break down those jobs for us. Okay, so the easiest one to start with is uh, sound design or sound editing. So sound design, I'm actually reluctant to call myself a sound designer because a sound designer is someone who takes a sound, no matter what that is, like a line roar or a car going by, and they manipulate it in a way that creates a whole new sound. So it doesn't resemble what it originally was. I very rarely do that because it's such a speciality. Um, so what I do is sound editing, which is taking sounds that are already existing and putting them into TV shows or feature films to bring a scene to life, bring the film to life. 
usually what happens in, especially in drama and feature film, I'd say about 70 to 80% of what you hear on screen is added in by the sound department. It's not recorded on the day. The dialogue, obviously, most of it is going to be from on set on the day, but everything else, like the car passes or someone even touching their face, someone, you know, putting on their coat, that's all added in by someone like me afterwards. So sound editing is where we will take the dialogue. We'll do a pass called a dialogue edit. We'll take out any clicks or bumps or wind noise or anything that would make it sound really odd. Um, So we clean that up. And then we start putting in the atmospheres. So if it's a scene where it's rainy or there's a storm, all of those sounds are put in by someone like me. Um, We will also uh, do up a Foley list, which is any sound effects that we can find. Explain Foley, which is a really specialised, fabulous job. Oh my God, they're so talented. It's unbelievable. Um, So what we do is we find the uh, sound effects that we can't find in our library and we send that list to a Foley artist. Foley artists are amazing. Um, There's a couple on Twitter that I follow and they literally will be out walking in the street. And you know the way people leave like, you know, their rubbish on the side of the road for the bin men to come and collect or, you know, the council to come and get. They will go through that rubbish and they will find gems that they call Foley gems to take home and add to their Foley like store. Something that will make a sound of some description that they might need in some hypothetical film situation yeah absolutely like they're they're so clever so if you see I always feel bad using this reference but it's the best one in horror movies if you see someone getting their head chopped off what they do is the foley artist will obviously have a a knife or whatever and they'll have a watermelon and they'll smash the watermelon and they'll have like literally slabs of meat and they'll be slamming the slabs of meat on the ground and um, they'll drop like watermelons from a certain height to get the smash. Uh, like they'll use like celery for uh, bones breaking. Um, there's always like the old video of a Foley artist using coconuts for horses hooves. That still happens. Um, and that's what they'll do. They'll find really clever and inventive ways of recreating sounds on screen that we just don't have the sounds for in our library. And they'll make it come to life. So like if it's a horse running by, like from left to right on screen, they'll make it like quieter and then get louder as it comes up to the screen and then get quieter again as it goes by. And yeah, it's just really, really specialized. So they, that's what Foley does, um, which I don't do because they're just creative geniuses and I'm not that creative genius. Yet. But they deliver all of those sounds back to you yes. because you've got gaps in your in your sound that you need to fill in. So you'll have given them the list, they'll do the list and then you can slot those into you. This is a long process. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of people don't realise how much work goes into sound because if you do sound correctly, a viewer shouldn't notice. They should just feel like, it's correct and it's part of the world and it's part of what they're looking at on the screen. If we don't do our job correctly, that's when people notice it and it takes them out of that immersive experience that you should get with a TV show or a film. Um, so it's... Yes. I, I also talk to, when I talk to young people, like they go, how can I make a film? I'm like, you've got a phone in your hand. Yeah. You can make a film with that. But just make sure the image can be a bit grainy. It can be a bit out of focus. That could be part of the story. We'll accept that, but we won't accept dodgy yeah. sound or static or or sound going in and out. You know, buy a, use a little body mic, you know, use use something that is is for the sound. And if you can get a friend, to be part of that too um you know that's going to sell or if your sound is rubbish you know find some music or put these sounds in afterwards you know everybody's got access to iMovie and GarageBand well I think if you have a Mac you do I'm not sure about PC but I'm sure there are there are programs that you can get on PCs and and actually that's the fun of it is is finding ways to to expand yeah. and fill out what you've yeah. shot. So do you do are you an have you been or are you an on set recordist? Have you no. ever done that? You're not the boom guy with really <laughs> sore arms. No. I always would be like, you can put it down <laughs> now. Or they just have they just, you know. I'm sure the first week of your, the first, you know, week of your life and your career, your shoulders and your, but then you just become incredibly strong and muscly (laughs) with your, 
with your sound boom. You've never done no. that. You, you've I'm not. too short. I think no. I just end up hitting all the actors in the head with the second boom. You'd always be in the show. <laughs> <laughs> just getting shouted at by the director. Yes, it, that, it is handy if that if you're tall. Yeah. yeah, I can see the advantage of being tall. Anyway, so back to that. And then there's ADR recording, yes. which, you know, um, looping, we used to call it yeah. in my day. I don't know if you still call it looping. Um, and it always used to make me a bit um, a bit seasick because in the olden days it was video, so you'd record it and then they'd rewind the tape and go back to the back to the one. But you'd watch this r- rewind oh. over and over again, and I'd come out of the studio going, "Oh my god, that's making my head spin!" But now because it's digital, they can just pop back to the right place. So ex- uh, explain ADR for us. Well, actually, it was a good segue from uh, on-set recording because this explains why it has to be done. Um, so if you're on set and there's a lot of background noise in a scene where there's quite a lot of dialogue, so say it's a period drama and you can hear traffic gone by or you can hear airplanes gone by, there is not traffic and there is not airplanes within that time period if it's a period drama. So obviously, we need to be able to re-record the dialogue cleanly so that you don't hear any of that sound. So what happens is an actor will come into a studio and they will, as you said, watch the scene and they will try and get back into the headspace of that character from that day. Um, It is possibly one of the hardest things an actor has to do. And I don't think they're given enough credit for how difficult a job it is. And you were asking them to go in. They might have finished shooting like three, four months ago. They might have gone on to another job and be in another character and be in another accent. And you're asking them to go back and go back into a character that they've left ages ago, um, possibly in a, an accent they've left ages ago, get back into that mindset, get back into that scene. But they're in an isolated environment with no other actors around them. And it's just in this sterile little room in a studio, you know, somewhere, if it's over here in the UK, somewhere in the middle of Soho with a director someone like me who's an ADR mixer and then an ADR supervisor asking them just to do a line again and again and again until so what they have to do is try and get their line in time in sync to the picture in the same pitch the same projection the same emotion um, unless the line has changed so they might have to learn new dialogue there and then on the day um, they also might have to change how they perform the line because the director has decided that they no longer like that performance and they want a slightly different performance, which is even harder because your face matches your performance. So if you're asking an actor to then go from, say they did a a very softly spoken, quiet performance on set in the day and the director's decided, no, I want it more forceful and want more projection. Your face isn't going to match that. So it's making the actor's job 10 times even harder. Um, So I'm there to make sure that it's recorded correctly, that the actor is comfortable. My job on the day is I don't give two fecks about the the director or the producer or the ADR supervisor. My concern is the actor and I want them to be comfortable and I want them to feel safe and secure and in the right headspace. And I will kind of, will go for a take and I probably have less than a minute to take that take If they haven't got it right in sync, then I need to cut it really quickly, put it in sync. I need to add in some background noise from the scene to make it feel like it's part of the scene. I need to EQ it. I need to put something called reverb on, which is uh, like an echo from the space. So if it's an outdoor scene, I need to make it sound like it's outdoors. And then I need to play it back for the director, producer, actor, and ADR supervisor and convince them that the line is going to work so then we can move on and do the next one. That's a lot of steps before you get to replay it. Yeah. Yes. It, it's a it's a ton of work. We, um, um, on Widow's Walk, we had um, uh, the little boy was 11 um, okay. and because it was an independent film and we took quite a long time to get to ADR, his voice had broken yeah. and there were a couple of, there were a couple of lines we needed to re-record with him and, and he'd also grown about six inches. So he walked yeah. in, he was like, hello, you know, like this. <laughs> and uh, we were like, oh, okay. And we, we tried. We, we tried to get him to think about, you know, how he sounded, uh, you know, 
18 months prior yeah. but actually we got my my dear friend Barbara Hausman is a top voice coach and we got her on FaceTime and I swear in less than a minute she had him placing his voice and visualizing placing his voice in in his head like a falsetto yeah. and and all of his lack of confidence and his embarrassment went away because he found his 11 year old voice for those two lines or whatever. And the, and the, a, the sound recorders was like, what, how did we do that? I was like, Barbara has do it. <laughs> thanks Barbara and she hung up and, and I was like, you can have her number. And cause it happens a lot, you know, yeah. you're talking about time passing between one performance and another you know, it is, it, there is a lot of sense memory, I think, um, yeah. in, you know, you see yourself, you remember the situation, you're, you know, you've got sort of um, a mental muscle memory that will take you back. But you're absolutely right to have that awareness that just jumping into it is, is not, <laughs> it's a skill uh. and, it, and it can take a while to ease into it. And, and I, I now realize that I've had some very, kind um sound engineers and and people who've been like that's okay we'll, we'll just we'll just keep you know having a go until we get it right or you you're having so many goes that you don't know which is the right one or whatever yeah. but it's all it's all part of the creative process isn't it and again all these many many layers and many many jobs and man and woman hours that go into making up just one minute what yeah. 10 seconds of film people just don't realize how f how far and wide and how deep the the creative process and the creative input and skill is and it's kind of one of the reasons i want to start shouting out about these these jobs and these creative participations in filmmaking because it's not just the actors it's not just yeah. writers and directors it's just an incredible world of of creativity and you just flick on netflix and watch a period drama you have no idea the the depth of 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 imagination and creativity that goes into it and of course it's what we love about it too isn't it yeah but we're it's funny like uh i don't know if you remember this but when ripper street um, the BBC drama first came out, there were so many complaints about the sound. And it got, because all of the actors were mumbling. Well, it was one of those situations where sound got blamed. So Ripper Street, the first series, the sound team got absolutely slated and the job got taken off them. And then it came to the company that I worked for for the second series. And same thing happened to us because... Nothing had changed in that no one had gone, spoken to the actors and said, you need to project. Because that's what was happening. They were all being very, very softly spoken on set and they weren't projecting. Part of the problem with the Mumblefest thing is that the directors, the producers, the actors, they obviously all studied the script for, you know, months, weeks in advance. They know the script, they know the dialogue inside out. So they know what they're saying. The director knows what they're saying. But you have location sound recorders Sometimes that come on set and they can say, I don't understand that. I think we need to go again. And often there may not be time uh, because schedules are so tight on set. But also sometimes the sound rec recordist isn't listened to. And they're just told, oh, no, you're just being difficult. You know, we're moving on. We don't have time. We need to get onto this next shot. And then it gets to post-production and they're like, oh, feck, we can't understand this. We're going to have to ADR it. And they'll come in, they'll do ADR and we'll try and say, you need to project more. And the actors will kind of fight back sometimes and say, no, this is how I performed it. Or no one will speak up and be honest about what the issue is. And so it doesn't really get fixed. And then it gets to air and then viewers start to complain that they can't understand what's being said. And they blame sound. They say, oh, the dialogue isn't mixed loud enough or the voices aren't mixed loud enough or the sound effects are too loud in the background. And it got to the point on uh, Ripper Street where the guys who I worked with and girls um, in my first company in Dublin, they were getting slated. They were getting named and shamed on BBC message boards. People were going onto IMDb, finding their names, then going onto these BBC message boards, putting their names up, um, putting links to their IMDb up and basically just slating them off and saying, these people are awful, they can't do their jobs. It was horrific. 
And it, so how did you come back from that? Was it just, what did it within the industry, within the BBC, did they say, you know what, we have to, we have to listen to the fact that our audience can't understand the dialogue and they're not following the story? The BBC and the producers got into a tizzy then and got really panicked. And their solution to the problem was to try and do more ADR that was projected, which really didn't work. And they also decided that the sound mix was going to change. So all of the background sounds had to be brought down quite a lot and the dialogue had to be pushed up. So then the show didn't sound amazing. And it ended up going to a different company the third year. And the same thing happened again because the problem hadn't been solved. No one had gone back to their core root of the problem. And that show was difficult as well because the writer had decided that the language had to be authentic to the era. So the language is very difficult to understand, which meant that you really needed the actors to be projected and to be pronunciating everything really clearly. And that wasn't happening. So you're making me think of um, Christopher Nolan. I have a huge bugbear with his films. I went to a screening um, of Interstellar. And it was at BAFTA, it was a BAFTA screening and all the actors were going to be there, Matthew McConaughey, uh, Anne Hathaway, they were all, it was a big sort of star fest. So the place was packed and they had, never before or since, they had someone come out at the beginning and say, just so you know, this film is very loud. I was like, <laughs> okay. So by about three quarters of the way in, I'm with a young filmmaker. He's come as my guest and he's like, oh, this is a masterpiece. It's a masterpiece. It's absolutely brilliant. I said, I cannot hear what the actors are saying because the sound and the music is so loud, so loud that they had to send somebody out to announce it at the beginning. And then I went to see Dunkirk. Same thing. I'm sitting there with my fingers in my ears. I know I'm watching a war film. Okay, fine. But again, I cannot understand what the actors are saying. And I'm so bombed. Bomb blasted? Bombasted. Bombarded. I'm so, like I'm like that old, you're too young to remember, there used to be like an, uh, um, um, you know, an ad for a sound. I know which one you're talking about, yeah. And, and the face is being blasted back by the sound. And he and his wife, who's his producer, they, they actually st- sat there in their Q&A afterwards, after Dunkirk, going, oh, our favourite bit is the post-production and the sound and everything. They didn't take any questions which was another first. He never, he didn't take any questions because he knew the, he must have known yeah. that the minute you bring up the sound, somebody's going to say, but mate, I can't hear half of what people are saying. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's a real, I have a real issue with it to the point where I just don't enjoy him or I don't rate him as a filmmaker because I cannot, I cannot hear the story. And I'm, and my ears are offended and abused by his choice of sound. How do people talk about it in the sound world? Well, look at what happened with Tenant, which was out um, just before Christmas. There was articles written about it in Variety and loads of magazines because they were, I, I remember a journalist actually from Variety contacting me and saying, have you seen Tenant yet? Because we're about to write an article on this and we just want to make sure that it's not us just, you know, not understanding sound, but there is actually an issue here. I was like, I'm really sorry, I haven't seen it yet. But then I pointed them in direction of uh, friends who I knew had. And every one of them was just like, no, he's like, it's mumbly. Um, the actors haven't projected, but also he's just whacked up all of the music and all of the sound effects. So you can't hear any of the dialogue. And it's a dialogue heavy movie that you need to follow the dialogue and understand in order to understand what's happening. But no one could follow the dialogue because no one could hear it. So yeah, he he is known for that. That's the way he likes his movies. And I'm the exact same. I find it really, really frustrating because I want to hear what the actors are saying. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. and, And I think this conversation just goes to show how important good, like you said, if it's really great sound, you don't even notice it, which is a huge shame for you. And if it's rubbish, it's the one thing you come away with. 
you know, and um, and doing sound, creating, adding the sound, creating the sound um, in film is, in my films, I've done a, a boxing film where the sound and the breath and the punches yeah. and, and, and there was a slow motion. So at one point we t- and he just had a, a, bl- a big punch. So I cut all the sound to nothing and yeah. it slowly, slowly comes back in as he sort of, regains his his composure and we also had a moment in in widow's walk oh this is interesting where um there's a moment where everything goes dead silent and the sound uh, mix said yeah well you can't you can't have absolutely no sound that's just not done i was like well why there was no there was no answer to it because why yeah. and again i've not been to film school so i don't know i just know what i want what i feel and when somebody says to me you don't do that that immediately makes me go away show me the book show me the yeah. filmmaker's bible that says that's not done well you know it just makes me look bad i said but what if it adds to the story like you cut the sound out and you actually have a reaction to you've been hearing sound 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 and for a couple of seconds there is nothing. Yeah. Well, nothing, nothing. So, and and we went backwards and forwards. Am I gonna? Am I gonna? You know, break the mold and put three seconds of absolutely no sound in my film. And it's because no sound is just as powerful yeah. as a whole cacophony of sound. The the biggest issue what I that I have with what you've just told me is that engineer's reaction because as a a sound engineer, your job or my job, and the way I see it at least, is I am there to help the director create their vision. I am not there to force my vision on a director or a client. I am there to help them bring to life their project that they have worked fecking hard on for, you know, months, weeks, years, however long. A lot of these projects have been in development for years before they eventually get made. But also let me add to that, that I'm looking for guidance as well. Yeah. Like I'm looking for somebody's input. We we always say like best idea wins. Like I might Mm. have an idea that I've had for years and then somebody comes along on the day with an e- with a better idea, best idea wins. Yeah. But that's all collaboration, isn't it? Too and yeah, it's 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 fascinating to me. And and to defend people who have a great deal of experience, they you know they're only doing what they know, what in their profession makes the best possible outcome so mm. far. So when somebody comes along, when a director comes along and said, "Well, I'd really like to try this. I'd really like to risk." my reputation but they don't see it as my reputation you know the composer sees it as their the the color grader sees it as their reputation because like you've like you've explained in something like the experience with ripper street is that nobody nobody understands the source of the problem they understand the net result yeah. of the of the problem or the outcome and and that you know it takes brave it takes brave creatives i guess and and it goes also to um uh, you know why directors and producers uh, hire the same people over and over because yep. over a, a period of of experience and and projects you build a relationship and a language and an understand oh this director works like this oh well i love that sound designer and what we did on such and such week yeah. why am i going to why gonna, am i going to look elsewhere further afield when this is just great have you seen more women coming into your profession yeah i mean it's gradually getting better but for a very long I have to say, randomly, the company that I worked for in Ireland had very good gender diversity. Black and ethnic minority diversity? No. I mean, I'm half Pakistani, half Irish. I was the only non-fully white person on the team. But in terms of gender diversity, we did actually have a a fair balance. Um, Like our Foley artist and Foley mixer uh, were both women. Um, I worked with two other sound uh, designers who were women in my department. Now, I was the only re-recording mixer in my company who was a woman. Um, All the rest were men, but we were okay. The UK, I found worse. Um, Yeah, the UK actually... So I worked in three different facilities before I went freelance uh, two, three years ago. And yeah, I think every... 
every facility that I worked in, I was the only woman in the sound team. Wow. Yeah. And that's come well, across the we, board. You see, going back to your story about being in your choir and having music, um, it, it also sort of feeds into my whole thing about how little credit and little importance is given to the creative arts in school yeah like you might not end up being a professional flute player but if you learn the flute and you learn scales and you learn to read music and you get to be in a school orchestra or you learn to sing hymns and you know sing at the carol surf all of that stuff or learn learn a shakespeare monologue because you know you're you're in a play none of those things have to end up being your job but if you if they are you've had a you just had this kickstart from yeah. a very early age and it's it's soul destroying to see how little credit is given to it so you had an amazing music teacher who had this school choir and she had this amazing idea to give you all the experience of recording yeah. you singing and that one girl in that class you got super passionate about it and 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 came into the profession but imagine how many other schools that didn't happen yeah. and how many other young women aren't doing the job you're doing because they never were exposed to that yeah. at an early age that that's that's what gets me that's that's what I want to crack that door open like even if you got a chink of it if you got a moment of it that you saw there was a job there, that there was a profession and you could earn your living and pay your rent and work with some amazing people and, and turn on your television and go, yeah, I did that. Yeah. I made that, I made that raindrop. You know, I made that, that's, you know. <laughs> but I think you've hit, you've hit the nail on the head and this is, so I mentor a lot um, and I used to mentor a lot with the Media Trust, which they have a, a mentoring ship program called, uh, hidden talent create oh god i can't remember the name of it but they have a really good mentoring we'll program it. we'll find yes. it and put it in in your listings yes um and they what they do is they help kids from uh disadvantaged backgrounds so they maybe haven't gone to university they have maybe had mental health problems some of them have been in prison um but the whole point of it is they want to have a job in the creative industry and they just need the help getting there and through mentoring those kids what i've seen um about the education system is that their career guidance counsellors, their teachers, everybody push them into safe careers. Like they, they kind of tell them, well, you want to be a doctor or you want to be a banker or you want to have like a stable job that will definitely pay your wage. But the problem is like the film and TV industry, especially here in the UK and I think in America and, you know, a lot of Europe as well now, it is a multi-billion pound industry. It has a ton of jobs. There are so many options for kids that they could be doing something to have that creative outlet, but that also pays their bills and gives them an incredible career and a really good life. But they're being denied those options because the way that the... They're not being exposed to it. Absolutely. And they're being forced down this garden path of a safe career that they ultimately end up hating and end up, you know, what's the word? Resenting later on in life and they feel like they've missed out on something and you do see I'm starting to see it a lot now where people are then getting to their 30s and retraining and entering the industry at a later point in life and actually finding it more difficult to progress in their careers because they're seen as older and companies don't want to take a risk on them because they are older but also they feel disrespectful offering them a very very low wage which is a whole other issue that I don't think we could even begin to crack today um, and so you you have this problem where you have all these really really passionate people who have waited so many years to try and get into this industry and then they're being stopped again because of misguided judgments by people who shouldn't be making assumptions about their lives it's like just give them the opportunity and that's another thing that uh, that we talk about at artemisia's daughters we go you know all we want to encourage all women of all ages yeah. because you know what you're also talking about is women who may have had a career in their 20s stop have children yeah. children grow up 18 years later they're, they're they're like right i now i've had not just 10 years, 15 years experience professionally before children. I've also had life experience woven into that. And now I'm ready to come back 
and they're at a loss to where to even start yeah. and retraining or you know m- mentoring finding somebody who will take a punt on them it, you're right it's almost more challenging than being fresh out of university yeah. or a training program and a lot of skill sets go sideways like you could argue that my being an actress I've moved sideways to being a director and I'm using so, and a writer yeah. I'm using so many of those skills yeah. and I think a lot of what we're coming up with speaking to you and speaking to the other women um, on this podcast is that a lot of times and it's more it stands more for women than for men is that we have to do it for ourselves you have to have a a deep-seated unerring passion Uh, you said I'm quite ambitious and you didn't say it with any any apology I am quite ambitious which men don't have to say. People, Men want the job, they go for it. Yeah. I mean, I'm being very general. But being ambitious as a woman is not considered an attractive thing. No, absolutely. And I've, I've been accused of that pushy, ambitious, yep. um, uh, you know, she knows what she wants. Well, good for her. Yeah. Guess what? She's probably going to get it. But it's not how we treat our young women. And, and, it's, and it's really... It's it's a shame that we have to be more forceful just to be in the same place as the men are. But then you also have the issue of, so I get this so much and it's part of the reason why I'm freelance. So I stand up for myself, which men do constantly. They, they have no issue with, you know, defending themselves if there is an unfair situation. When I do it, I get told that I am cutting off my nose to spite myself. I'm being difficult. Oh, I love the difficult line. I get branded that all the time. Um, that I am being outspoken, that I should just be quiet, that I should keep my opinions to myself. Um, you know, all of this. And I, so I speak out a lot about diversity and about inclusion and I, um, actually, I, I, this is probably the best example of this. Um, so Netflix recently, they announced that they were doing a panel on uh, DAWs. So it's basically a piece of uh, equipment that we use in audio. And it was about like different techniques. So we use a soft piece of software called Pro Tools, but there's, and that's a DAW. So there's other ones like, um, I don't know, Reaper and Logic and uh, GarageBand would be a DAW. And they decided that they were going to hold this panel um, for all of the sound engineers, sent out an invite. The whole panel was men. There was no women. Now, this is a company who has said that they are investing millions in diversity and inclusion schemes to make sure that they are representing everybody um, equally, not just on screen, but off screen. I bet you they didn't even notice that it was all men. They just went down the line and invited the first 10 names top names they could get to say yes well some of it was in-house some of it was their in-house staff and some of it was external people and it was organized by men and I got the invite and I responded to them and I said are you kidding me and I obviously was very polite in my email but I said you know this isn't okay and there should be women on this panel this is not reflective of a company that has said that they are investing millions into being diverse Um, I didn't get a response but Thankfully, I'm a persistent little fecker and I'm stubborn. And I knew people quite high up at Netflix because I've had conversations with them about diversity. And I contacted them and I, I called them out publicly on social media as well. And I deliberately did that because I knew that certain people would see it and they would get in contact, which is what happened. But what surprised me was that I got a private message from a woman who's quite high up in the sound industry in the States to the point where she is involved in, actually, I'm not going to name the organizations because I don't want to out her, but she's quite high up in two fairly big sound organizations. And she contacted me saying, "Um, I don't think you should be causing such an issue about this. I don't see a problem with there not being any women on the panel. Um, There's two people from black or ethnic minority um, backgrounds on the panel um, there's not enough space there to represent everybody in the world unfortunate as it may be um, and this whole like whole big spiel she's drunk the kool-aid she has drunk she's the in hollywood and she doesn't want to make and en- that's what says to me she doesn't want to make any waves in case it jeopardizes her position yeah. as one of the few women in the industry don't don't make it worse yeah. 
But the worst part of it was her, her message. So she sent me two messages and the second message finished off with, um, you know, I've heard a lot about the work that you do. And, you know, I think it's very great. And I'm still happy to share the space with you. And the way the last line read was, well, if I wasn't feckin' happy, I'd be making trouble for you and I'd make sure that you weren't going to have uh, any work. Now, she has no impact on my work whatsoever. She can, she can do what she feckin' likes. But I just thought, wow, this is coming from another woman. And part of me was surprised and part of me was like, yeah, I know that this is going to happen. Yeah, because you, unfortunately, women are in a really, really horrible position where we have to face... Um, you know, difficulties for men. We have to face sexism for men, but we also have to face difficulties from other women. There are women of a certain generation or a certain background who have gotten to the position where they are, which is usually quite high up. And Sharp elbows. They've they've kind yeah. of they've kind of shimmied their way to the top, and they don't they feel that scarcity yeah. because that's their only experience, and they feel the lack of opportunity, and they're gra- yeah. they're holding on to it with both hands. Yeah. And, and she was trying to pay lip service by saying, "Well, there's still room for you, love." And I know it's a competitive industry, but so is law, so is the you know medicine, so are these other respected professions, and. You know, just if we create abundance, if we create more work for ourselves, and that's that's what it ends up being, actually, that you you make your own work. Yeah. Uh, You know, and I have, uh, you know, I have uh, disabled friends. I have female friends and we're all we're all there was no way I was going to go to a, a production company or a studio with my first film and have them invite me to make it for them yeah it had to be all on my own and every so often I go well do I have to do that again or will I get what do I have to keep create yes I have to keep creating my own opportunities and you obviously do because bottom line Emma you're obviously really good at your job because if you sucked, nobody would invite <laughs> you back, right? I mean, that's yeah. the other thing too about this this industry. It's a meritocracy. Yeah. If you're good and you put the hours in, and it's hours and a thousand, you know, forget ten thousand hours. Talk about a yeah. hundred thousand hours. You do, you you mentioned I did stuff on my own time. I you know I took pieces and I experimented and I. I'm you you made it it didn't feel like work did it it was so exciting and it was so fun to do people see that people see that and they will give you the opportunity again and again and again I can't underscore that I can't emphasize that more in this in this industry but I think I mean the pressure that I feel when I look at the industry and I look at my male counterparts I mean, there's 10 times more pressure on me to not feck up than there is on them. And I have seen men in the industry. I had this conversation with a male colleague before and he was like, oh, I don't agree with this. And I was like, well, and he's actually, a, a, you know, an ally. And I totally believe that he just doesn't see it because he's got his blinkers on. But I kind of said, as a woman, I cannot feck up because if I feck up, that's it. I will not get another opportunity. That will be me blacklisted from that particular client or that prediction particular post-production facility and I won't get hired again whereas if I was a bloke that wouldn't happen they'd just be like oh yeah you kind of cock that one up but we'll hire him again anyways we'll give him another shot and um, because they well, might you hear, but it's about, you hear it about directors too yeah. that, that men can make a mediocre film or a film that doesn't do well at the box office but one a woman makes one yeah one bad you know isn't the the the, the director of the twilight series I think she, oh Catherine know, Hardwick that's all, Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. She she's like a classic example of that. You know, one of the biggest grossing franchises of its time. We're going to have to resume this conversation because it's so important. And um and now that you're one of the daughters, <laughs> one of Artemisia's <laughs> daughters, you're in the fam and Love it. um it's been absolutely fascinating to hear you speak and um but also to enjoy your successes, because I think your your point of view, the, your outlook is absolutely spot on. And it, again, if anybody listening to this could go, you know, that's kind of what it takes. I might have to tap into some of that too. I think it's very inspiring. Oh, thank you. 
I don't know if I totally agree with that, but <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't see it. You're not. You're not supposed no. to see it. You're supposed to be modest and. I know, you know self-deprecating like... Irish is. You know, <laughs> this is where it all comes. Yeah, out. I know, but yeah. well, you know, you got that going for you as well. So that's, <laughs> it's just really marvelous, Emma. Thank you so much. No thank worries. you, thank you, and um, and we'll put all of your links to your work and your MDB. In Fierce the... Female Filmmakers is a production of Artemisia's Daughters. For more information, go to artemisiasdaughters.org. Our theme tune is composed by Charlie Mackey.